Hello and welcome to Sharon Local History, welcome to Sharon Massachusetts. In this video I would like to tell you more about an annual meeting that Sharon Friends of Conservation held this past Saturday. So Sharon Friends of Conservation is a local non-profit group that does take care of conserving nature of Sharon. They are basically right arm of the town committee conservation commission. So uh, the group holds yearly annual meeting um, and annual elections. This was held at Cottage Street and um, I was quite impressed how many people came and how lovely event this was. Uh, not only that um, dinner was included, but there were also two excellent speakers that I will tell you a little bit more about. So Sharon Friends of Conservation is a fantastic group of people who do enjoy nature, local hikes, take care of the bluebirds and most of all upkeep of our trails. They also do create new trails and they can always use more help. So this on the left is past president Kurt Berman and on the right is new president Gorath Shah. So I would like to thank everybody who was involved in preparing this meeting and organizing it and getting the food. I also would like to thank local businesses who donated the food. So thank you very much and also thank you to Leo Waters who prepared everything for us. The past president, this is Gaurav Shaw, who's taking the reins, doing an amazing job. Uh, uh, just to say, what was it? Oh yes, to introduce you and help me doing most of the stuff this evening. Uh, I can't think of too much else that I have other than introduce So Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gaurav Shah and this is my first potluck as president of the Sharon Friends of Conservation. So hello to everyone. Uh, I've been getting a lot of congratulations for being the president. I don't remember at what point I was given the choice. In the matter, so, uh, uh, but thank you anyway. Uh, it, it's a great honor. Uh, and I'm really enjoying the, the adventure. I'd like to quickly uh, start off by uh, some thanks. We have some board members who uh, decided not to continue. Mary Tobin, Dan, and Jim Barron. They have done an amazing job. We are very, very grateful for uh, to them for their contributions over the years. Uh, they will always be welcome at meetings and uh, we will always be happy to hear their opinions. So, Gaurav, thank to many other volunteers who are chipping in to make this group a successful group and uh, continue with its mission. He thanked people who are working on the website, on the newsletter, who take care of the snacks, membership and many other um, parts of running this group, Sharon Friends of Conservation. By the way, um, there's always need for more volunteers. If you would like to be involved, please do contact um, either Gorav or you can go to their website. Um, Gorav also talked about his dreams for future of uh, Sharon Friends of Conservation and he definitely agreed that upkeep of the trails and uh, gaining more members, especially younger generation, is important for this group. So again, if you would like to help, um, please uh, let us know. The trail stewards is very satisfying. If you do on regular basis hike certain area of Sharon, certain trail, and you will be willing to keep an eye on fallen trees and pick up sticks and chip the weeds to let Gorav know. So after the presentation we had, after the introductions, we had lovely snacks. As you can see, there was plenty of food to eat. Um, coriander donated a chicken tikka masala that was amazing. And many volunteers brought food that they prepared. As you can see, everything is super healthy. It was a great meal and once again I appreciate everybody who chipped in and brought meal. This is this annual picnic is fantastic way 
for the members to meet and get to know one another and plan the future of Sharon Reserve Conservation. So now on the program was the first speaker, Paul Lowenstein, who talked about the wildlife sightings in Sharon. Yeah, you'll have to excuse me. I'm going to um, read from a script that I'm 74 and I can't remember my stuff very fast. So <laughs> you're a youngster yet. Sorry about that. Um, and this takes about 15 minutes. So uh, feel free to continue eating and enjoy the wonderful desserts over there. Um, May 22nd is the United Nations International Day for Biodiversity. But what about the other 364 days of the year? About 15 years ago, the Sharon Friends of Conservation decided to engage people in sharing their observations and photos of our local wildlife on a year-round basis. We set up a page on our website that anyone can use to report their wildlife sightings. Anything wild and alive within the boundaries of Sharon is eligible for inclusion. Since then, we have posted over 1,300 sightings, representing approximately 600 species, but there are plenty more species in Sharon that we have not yet documented. Encounters with nature are unpredictable, so keep your camera handy. The wildlife sightings are organized into categories to make it easier to find things. The main categories are animals, insects and spiders, and plants. Each main category is divided into subcategories. There is also a chronological list of sightings by date, which can be searched if you want to find a particular sighting. Marshall Catler photographed this lady's tresses or orchid last September, the photo on the left. There are over 100 species of wildflowers on our website, including several species of wild orchids. One of the most spectacular is the pink lady slipper, which blooms in May. You can get an idea about when and where to find wildflowers by looking them up on our website. Please don't attempt to transplant wild plants. They are adapted to the conditions in the spot where they are growing and typically don't survive being transplanted. Yellow star grass is another example of the diversity of plant life found in Sharon's woods. Before photographing this wildflower, I'd never heard of blue-eyed grass. Indian cucumber root is an interesting woodland plant. Its roots are edible. Jack in the pulpit is another interesting woodland plant, but it is definitely not edible. Narav <laughs> Shah photographed this crown-tipped coral fungus along a trail near Billing Street last July. Marshall Catler took this photo of a marble orb weaver spider. Spiders give me the creeps, but I have to admit, this one is beautiful. I took this photo of a snowberry clearwing moth last August with a seating on the butterfly bush in our backyard. I also encountered this red spotted admiral butterfly in my backyard last August. We have about 75 species of moths and butterflies on the website. This white admiral is a color variant of the red spotted admiral in the previous photos. David Kaufman encountered this spectacular luna moth on June 20th last summer. Adult luna moths only live for a few days during which they mate and die. Maybe one of you will be lucky enough to see one this June. Bruce Lewis submitted this photo of a black racer last summer. Uh, Eldad Ganin spotted this monster stamping turtle basking on a rock in Hammershop Pond. <laughs> uh, speaking of large wildlife, Emily Smith Lee photographed this black bear trundling through her yard on Moose Hill Parkway on July 30th, 2022. Last year, Kurt Bjorman and Richard Mandel took videos of a black bear in their yards on May 6th and June 24th. The videos can be seen on our website. Canada warblers have a necklace re re reminiscent of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> this one was migrating north through Sharon last May. Black-throated blue warblers also migrate through Sharon in May. This brightly colored black Bernian warbler has caught a green caterpillar to help fuel its epic migration. 
Pine warblers nest in this sharon. I photographed this one last June. You can find them using a free cell phone app called Merlin that will tell you which birds are singing nearby. Furry warblers also nest in Sharon. You can find them in June under the power lines that cross the trustees of reservations Moose Hill Farm. Ever hear of a worm-eating warbler? We have them in Sharon. Oh. I heard this blue-winged warbler singing before I saw it along the boardwalk at Moose Hill. Will Sweet took this photo of a hooded warbler last May at Moose Hill Audubon. Hooded warblers normally don't range north of Connecticut. This could be another sign of global warming. Hummingbirds nest in Sharon and feed at hummingbird feeders from late April until mid-September. They fly 2,500 miles back to Central America for the winter. I took this picture using a shutter speed of one five thousandth of a second. Wow. <clears throat> Pileated woodpeckers are among the most spectacular birds in Sharon. This one had a nest in a dead tree at Moose Hill Audubon. One day last January, as I was sitting at my desk in my house talking on the phone, I saw this young red-shouldered hawk land on the ground right outside my window. I picked up my camera with my free hand and took this photo. <laughs> my friend John Bauer, who is an expert birder, helped me identify it. If you get a photo of wildlife in Sharon that you can't identify, submit your sighting using the form on the home page and someone will help you identify it. <clears throat> Next I'll present some of my favorite photos from past years. This osprey has a fish in one of its talons. It is landing on a cell tower by the composting area on Farnham Road where it had built a nest and was raising its young. Barred owls are common in Sharon, but they are more often heard than seen. Their call sounds like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? <laughs> At midnight on June 28, 2011, Richard Kramer heard this young screech owl making a racket outside, so he grabbed his camera and got this photo. Lynn Zollo, who works at Moose Hill Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary, submitted this photo of a tiny, soft wet owl. He bans them to learn more about their movements. Eric Zanuski got this remarkable shot of a fisher cat in June 2020. I think Mr. Yeah, Zanuski is in our audience. Uh, did you know that fisher cats are weasels, not cats, and they don't typically eat fish? <laughs> <laughs> the common name Fisher Cat is likely to have derived from early European settlers in their acknowledgement of the animal's superficial resemblance to the European pole cat, which is sometimes referred to as a fiche or a fish. <laughs> this black swallowtail butterfly <clears throat> perched on a wild grapevine at New Hill Farm. This tiger swallowtail was feeding on a thistle blossom at Gavin's Pond Dam. <laughs> This American copper butterfly was feeding on a daisy blossom in our yard. The field at Morrison Lakeview is a good spot to find butterflies. This is a chrysalis of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. This is the adult bar of Baltimore checker spot butterfly. This great spangled fritillary butterfly was also seen in the same field. So was this spice bush swallowtail butterfly, which was feeding on a milkweed blossom. Flowering crab apple trees are a good place to look for colorful warblers and orioles because the blossoms attract insects that the birds eat. Here's an acrobatic blue wing warbler and a flowering crab apple. If you spend time in the woods during the songbird migration, sometimes you get lucky. This is a chestnut sided warbler. Indigo buntings can be found in summer under the high tension lines near Moose Hill Farm. Scarlet tanagers are common in Sharon, but seldom seen because they live in the woods. To find them, learn to recognize their song. Brown creepers climb up tree trunks looking for insects, but they can only climb upwards, so when they reach the top, they fly back down and start over. <clears throat> Blue-gray gnat catchers are smaller than chickadees. Note the divide in its breast feathers for exposing its warm skin to incubate its eggs. Bobolinks require large meadows. Sometimes bobolinks can be seen in the cow pasture at Moose Hill Farm. 
I took this tip photo of a female cardinal out our kitchen window. Josh Simon, that I think he's here tonight, photographed this Rossus goose at Wallapog, on Walla Wallapog Pond. This species is seldom seen in Massachusetts, so birders flock to share in the sea. <clears throat> Believe it or not, on May in May 2013, this white pelican showed up at Lake Massapequa. <laughs> As this rain map shows, white pelicans don't normally visit share. <laughs> Our website has several bald eagle sightings. Richard Kramer took this photo near Lake Massacre. We have reptiles and amphibians that share. This northern water space is basking at the Gavin's Pond Dam. Marsha Tranovich sighted this harmless milk snake warming itself in her garden. But when threatened, milk snakes sometimes vibrate their tails and dry leaves to imitate the sound of a rattlesnake. Box turtles are a species of special concern in Massachusetts. Much of the box turtle habitat in Sharon has been lost to development, such as the new mall going in across from Shaw's Plaza. When I saw this one crossing South Main Street, I stopped the car and moved it off the road. This red F was crossing Moose Hill Street on big night at the end of winter, when amphibians head for wetlands and vernal pools to mate and deposit their eggs. Bruce Lewis found this yellow spotted salamander on the road near Moose Hill Farm in March 2022. It was heading for a nearby wetland to spawn. This white sucker was trying to ascend Sucker Brook to spawn in mid-April, but the culvert under Mass Park Avenue got in its way. Kurt Bjorman worked with the Boy Scouts to build a fish ladder to solve the problem. This, the leaves of birch foot violets are shaped like bird's feet. They bloom in early spring, so they should be blooming about now. Rita Corey found this downy rattlesnake plantain beside a trail on Rattlesnake Hill. Although its leaves are shaped like those of plantain weeds, downy rattlesnake plantain is not a plantain, it is a member of the orchid family. Mm -hmm. Rita Corey also found this cardinal flower growing in a dry stream bed. And Rita's here, I think. Thank you for those contributions, Rita. Uh, dwarf ginseng was used by Native Americans as a herbal remedy. This late purple aster was blooming in the fall under the high tension wires near Moose Hill Farm. Field horsetail is an ancient plant species that has endured since the age of the dinosaurs. Sharon has beautiful mushrooms, but many are poisonous, so don't eat them unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> Chicken of the woods is an edible fungus that grows on trees. Large specimens can weigh, can weigh upwards of 80 pounds, but the smaller ones taste better. <laughs> Susie Levinson snapped this shot of a bobcat ambling through her yard on Billing Street in June 2014. A few years ago, three young red foxes showed up in our backyard. This one seemed unsure about whether the neighbor's cat would make a good playmate or a good meal. <laughs> Elon Fisher made a wonderful video of red fox kits in his backyard. The link is on our website in the mammal section of the wildlife site. Sharon also has gray foxes, one of only two canid species in the world that can climb trees. A canid species, of course, is a dog-like mammal. This peculiar insect is a great leaf skeletonizer moth. This photo uh, from the internet shows grape leaf skeletonizer larvae skeletonizing a grape. <laughs> <laughs> the Halloween pennant is one of over 30 species of dragonflies on our website. The bright green eastern pond hawk dragonfly is another. In addition to dragonflies, our website features many beautiful damselflies, such as this turquoise bluet. Sharon residents pay high taxes, but at least we don't have to fly to Africa to go on safari. <laughs> the possibilities for discovering wildlife here in Sharon are endless. You can find trail maps on our website. Feel, uh, free cell phone apps such as Merlin and Seek make it much easier to find and identify birds, plants, and other wildlife. With binoculars, a good camera, and plenty of patience and persistence, 
You'll be amazed at all the photogenic wildlife you can find in Sharon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And the next speaker was Gorak talking about his passion for bugs. This is a Massachusetts web. The state of Massachusetts has a website, uh, uh, interactive website, with a list of all the vernal pools in Massachusetts. Oh, really? These are the mass, these are the vernal pools in Sharon. Each of these asterisks. Uh, so as you can see, there are many of them. There are, uh, we are really lucky to have lots and lots of vernal pools. Most of my work has been in Moose Hill. Uh, as you can see, there are plenty of, I'm sorry, there are plenty of vernal pools in Moose Hill, but the ones where, where all of these photos were taken that are coming up is this one over here on the vernal pool trail on the right-hand side, and over here in the marsh area, which is technically not a vernal pool, but you're already here, so don't, don't leave just because of that. <laughs> I, <laughs> it does dry out, so it has a, some of the requirements for a vernal pool. Species in Massachusetts isn't that difficult uh, when it comes to insects because they are underexplored. That's why if you anybody who wants to get in, dive right in. You can find new things. Uh, this is another kind of beetle, a hydrophilic beetle. Uh, this one, I could I, I could not identify myself to species uh, or genus, and no, neither could anybody else, but the most likely identification actually is also the first sighting in the Massachusetts. Uh, now we get to the crustaceans, and there are many, many crustaceans uh, found in vernal pools. People aren't aware of land crustaceans or uh, freshwater crustaceans as much as they could be, partly because these are all tiny. Uh, like I said, in, in vernal pools, they're absolutely everywhere. Uh, they're, they're related to lobsters and shrimp and crabs. Uh, I'll show you the, I, they have only one eye spot and I'm gonna show you that in a photograph soon. This is the interesting part. I've never seen this myself. Oh. They're known to jump out of the water, like porpoises. <laughs> and dive back in. I would love to catch this sometime. I've never been able to see it. Uh, so I've taken hundreds and hundreds of photographs of these copy pods. And believe me, this is not an easy one to get. Out of those hundreds and hundreds of photographs, I finally got a, a reasonable one. You know, it's one of them, many reasonable ones, but this was, this was not easy. This bright spot over here is where the light from the camera is getting reflected back from the eye, from the E-Y-E -E singular eye. Uh, they have only one eye, uh, so it's called a cyclops, uh, as, a, as a common name sometimes. It's kind of, it's pretty funny looking because we're not used to animals that have exactly one eye. Yeah. Uh, again, this is another one. This is, uh, this is also a male. Over here, what look like eggs are actually Fatty, uh, fatty globules. And they have plenty of carotenoids in them. Uh, and this is, they're not the only uh, crustaceans that do this. Uh, we'll go to, we'll, we'll see some more, uh, like shrimp. So flamingos actually, uh, for, most of their, for, many, for most of their cycle, are not pink. <clears throat> uh, what, what, what flamingos do is they migrate, find a good source of Brine shrimp, not fr not freshwater shrimp. The brine shrimp that they eat have plenty of carotenoids, and that's how the flamingos get pink, get the pink color. So what we're seeing here is basically related to the fact that flamingos are pink. Those little globules in there. I think we large amounts of them on vernal pools. Uh, they can walk on the water, yeah, even the ones that are not really designed for the life. Uh, so you'll find plenty of them uh, walking on the water, the, so they're barely touching the surface tension. For them, the water is almost like a solid body. Uh, however, there are other kinds of spiders that are that really are adapted for this. Uh, Dolmides, the fishing spiders, are able to dive down underneath and and catch prey. They they again try to get some uh, uh, air uh, airs uh, with them. Uh, 
uh, air bubbles to help them breathe. They can actually catch fish, small fish. And it's always kind of spooky when an invertebrate catches a vertebrate, <laughs> but uh, it's also kind of cool. Here's, here's one in Eliganine. Uh, these are not adapted to water, but they have no problem if they do happen to find themselves on the surface. Uh, again, this is a wolf spider. Uh, by the way, Josh, this is your this is a photograph that you helped with Topaz in Deep Lorraine. Uh, and again, you can see that it's barely touching the surface tension of the water. There, there really is no little uh, bump underneath the legs. Springtails are six-legged invertebrates, hexapora, that are not insects. They're not plants. They're related to insects, but they're not actually insects. Uh, if you found snow fleas, those are kinds of sprinkles. They, they, you can find them in huge quantities on snow. This is another kind. They're, the, I used to be surprised when I found them in water because they're naturally uh, underground, but it turns out they're semi-aquatic. They are very comfortable on the uh, in vernal pools, and every now and then you can find a big congregation of them that's ab absolutely uh, completely covering the surface of the water. Okay, so this, uh, if you want to film, uh, this is a nondescript little invertebrate. Uh, it's kind of interesting in that this one actually uh, is this this photograph is the first recording of this species in the United States. Wow. Uh, and again, this is what happens in invertebrates. They, they're they understudied. You know, they, there, there aren't a lot of universities that, are, that can study them. It's up to amateurs to a large extent. Uh, I think this is the second uh, actual record. This was the second record in North America, in fact. Uh, it's called Smithery's Mount Granny and uh, it's, trust me, I could not identify it myself. <laughs> Hybrid and India are water mites, which means that they're quite closely related to spiders. Uh, but they live underwater. They live, uh, they're by, uh, by force underwater. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, even though they're uh, arachnids, the larvae are parasites, which is really unusual in the arachnid world. They, uh, they parasitize, parasitize flies, uh, dragonflies, caddisfly larvae. And I, I, it's really weird watching them swim because like I said, they, they are, they look like spiders. So they don't, it doesn't look like they're swimming. It looks like they're walking. Uh, that's what it looks like. You can see the feathered legs over here. Yeah, their legs are kind of feathered, uh, probably not if you're sitting too, too far back. Uh, it looks like they're walking in three dimensions. It's, it's very strange watching them swim. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, frankly. Caddisflies. Caddisflies are a type of insect. The grown-ups are quite closely related to, to moths. In fact, they're often confused for moths. Uh, the larvae, on the other hand, are aquatic. And they are really spectacular. Uh, can you see the larvae here? Uh, the yeah, answer is probably not. not. <laughs> uh, that's because they have an incredible adaptation. The larvae, which are kind of like caterpillars, create this, take the debris around them and create a casing. This whole thing is a casing that was manufactured by the larva. So it's like a snail or a turtle, <coughs> but they make, except they make their own. Uh, and if it's on one, they don't stay in one spot. They are mobile. They just have a suit of armor that they've constructed themselves. And this is a kind of dramatic photo. You can see the head coming out over here, out of the casing. Uh, here, this, this is a slightly better angle. You can see the, this part is coming out. The rest of it is the casing. 
and there was a really nice video. <laughs> you should have seen the one that got away. Yeah. Interestingly enough, there are jewelers out there who take the larvae, put them in a tank of their own, give them gold thread, semi-precious metals, uh, semi-precious stones, and the larvae create their own jewelry. And you can buy that online. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, as far as I know, the caddisflies do not get a cut of the profits. <laughs> I, unfortunately, uh, it seems a little unfair to me, but uh, that, that's life, I guess. Uh, point out, I just want to point out, if you can see, there's this gelatin substance all over the egg, sac, egg, egg mass. I don't know if you can see that, but it's there. Uh, so, I was kind of interested in knowing what species of salamander um, Lead this in this. So the first step is, of course, that it is a salamander. Salamander egg clutches have that gelatin all around them. If they were frogs, it looks more like uh, a bunch of grapes. You can see each individual egg with its own gelatin around it, but there are bumps. With salamanders, there's one big egg, uh, gelatin mass around the whole clutch. Uh, Blue spotted salamander cl egg clutches look like that. However, they're smaller. They don't lay as many eggs at a time. Jefferson salamanders do lay that many eggs. However, they don't come from the seas. You have to go come this far east. You have to go to western Massachusetts to find them. <clears throat> and so by a process of elimination, this is probably a spotted salamander egg clutch <clears throat> that we just saw. Uh, so. Once you find that, once I find these, so right now, uh, this this year, I went to the boardwalk, and there are no less than I counted no less than three egg clutches this time, which is a good sign. I've never seen more than one there. So if you go there now, you should be able to see uh, if if you look very carefully, you should be able to find a bunch of egg clutches uh, at Mo at Moose Hill uh, off the boardwalk right now. Uh, so once I find the egg clutches, I try to come back regularly and see how the eggs develop. So here, I don't know if you can see. You can see a little baby salamander growing there. <clears throat> so these are some of the favorite photographs I've, I've taken. Uh, I really enjoyed watching them grow. Uh, here. How much time between? Uh, about a week or so between. Okay. Here you can see the, it's a, almost, it's, it's, getting, it's getting to be fully developed into a tadpole at this point. <clears throat> you can see, you can see the, the head is distinct. You can see, I think, gills. Okay. These are probably gills gr growing. And that's, that's it for our talk. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> So I did not record a full uh, presentation by Gorav, however I snapped a few short videos and this is the vernal pools of Sharon that are known. Um, the meeting was fantastic, there were two very interesting presentations and that is on schedule at least once a year during the annual picnic, however Sharon Friends of Conservation is planning to do more local hikes combined with Sharon Historical Society and we do include historical information in information about nature and as Gorav mentioned during his president's speech he is planning to bring more um, specialists on different areas so if you would like to join Sharon Friends of Conservation you're more than welcome to and thank you for watching Sharon Local History <laughs>